Hello. So I'm I'm Catherine. Um, I was asked to talk here, um, I think, because I I wrote for the game Astral Augusta, which came out this year. Um, I also did some writing for um, Over the Alps, which also came out this year. Um, and there's comedy in the title, and I'm going to talk a bit about comedy, but unfortunately, um, for maybe some of you. Um, it's only part of the talk. I'm, I'm sort of kind of talking about culture today in the hallowed institution of the, the British Library. Um, I'm very intimidated as a colonial um, New Zealander. Um, it, this talk is kind of about the place of comedy in games today. Um, so when we think about comedy and we think about um, comedy games that we love, um, often people will say um, that their favourite comedy games were from the 90s. Um, because in the 80s and 90s were a great time for humour in games. Um, and so looking back, you kind of think, well, what happened? You might have expected comedy in games to go from strength to strength. And now in 2019 to be a well-loved and established genre. But I think it's fair to say that that didn't really happen. Um, there are notable exceptions, of course, um, but comedy isn't that big in games. Not when you compare it to um, the big genres in film and television. So why is this? Um, I think you can certainly point to the, the death of adventure games in the late 90s. Um, 3D games with... Uh, ultra-realistic sort of graphics, or probably ultra-realistic for the time, um, kind of pushed adventure games uh, aside, and especially um, small budget games. Um, but I am going to talk about um, other factors, or one other factor I think may be indirectly involved, a factor that's not to do with the market or, or not to do with technology, um, but it's to do with culture. Um, and I think it has had, an, well, it certainly had an indirect well, influence on my um, practice as a game developer and how I see my work, um, including comedy. Um, and what is this thing that, that I think is an influence? I think it's, um, I'll sum up as, as saying, it's our struggle to be taken seriously. Sorry, this is not taking me seriously. It's, I said I wasn't going to talk about technology, but fuck this technology. I'm sorry, British Library, you've got fantastic gear and everything. It's, I'm really happy to be here. Let's have some more water. So, um, for the last 20 years, workers in our industry have found ourselves caught up in a culture war about what we do. Um, do games cause real world violence? Are they art? Are they trash? Um, and are women like me and the SJWs among us um, ruining games? Um, so I think we've been sort of caught, caught between these kind of polar, kind of uh, like, caught, caught between anti-intellectualism, um, aggressive anti-intellectualism on the one hand, and a sort of cultural cringe and frustration that games aren't taken seriously on the other hand, and a sort of a, a need to prove ourselves. And, of course, we've made massive strides in gaining cultural legitimacy over the last um, decade or two, or two. But it makes me wonder um, what the residual effects of years of defensiveness and having to prove ourselves um, and self-justify ourselves um, has been on us. It certainly had an effect on me and it's, it's shaped my work, so... Um, and I, I suspect it's had an effect on us all, even on, on the basic level of, you know, the response you get when you when you admit to someone at a dinner party or a barbecue that you're a game developer. I mean, it's not always uh, it's not always positive. So I'm going to take us back. Um, I'm going to sorry, this is going to reveal a bit about my age, uh, which I was hoping to disguise this morning in the bathroom. Um, totally undermining that now. Um, so back in 2001, I'd been in game development um, for two or three years, and I was working at a studio called Melbourne House um, in Melbourne. Um, one thing I noticed um, about my colleagues, who were really talented and skilled, I have to say, um, gosh, I don't know what the time is, but Alistair is going to come and sit down on that chair down there 
in half an hour, so that's good. Aren't you, Ella's dear? <laughs> Somewhere, because I'm not timing this. I didn't click the right thing. Some, some, it's going to be fine. Okay, so my colleagues, right? Um, they, they're talented, they were skilled, um, they're idealistic, they're highly creative, um, but they went home from work um, and made music, painted paintings, wrote screenplays, often really awful ones. They wrote novels and they made short films, and the one thing they definitely didn't do was make work on their own games. Um, and, and it was because um, they wanted to create something meaningful and important, um, and they didn't think that they could do that in games, or certainly not in a way that would, would have people respecting them. Um, and, I, and I know that many of you will think I'm exaggerating about this, but I, I want to assure you it was a very different world. Um, and the attitudes towards game development um, were certainly different, and it was not a very glamorous industry compared to what it is today. Because um, my, my colleagues would literally say um, that they loved their jobs, but they were embarrassed to tell people what they did, um, and that their side projects, as I said, made them fail, feel more worthwhile as creators. And at the time, I thought this was a terrible waste, um, a big misdirection of energy from people who had really valuable skills. And I personally wanted to do important and meaningful work, but in games. <coughs> and I felt frustrated that I, ha I lacked the opportunity to do this. Um, I looked at people in television and, and radio, and I saw that they had the public um, broadcasting kind of infrastructure to support them. Um, and I looked at filmmakers who were supported by arts funding. So I, um, oh God, wrong, right. Uh, so I put together for a, a pitch for a, a serious game, an important game, and I put together a team to make it, and I tried to apply for some of this public screen culture and arts funding, right? But when I talked to people administering these grants, they told me, we don't fund games. We fund interactive screen-based art, for example. Um, but I said, that's what, that's what a game is. And what I want to make is art. Just because it's a game doesn't mean it's not worthwhile culture. And they said, well, OK, then. If you're not going to go away, prove to us that games can be art. So I was a good little girl, and that's what I did, or, or attempted to do. Um, oh, shit. I didn't bring my prop. I had. See, I wrote this massive document in 2002, and I kept it up until this day, and it's back at the hotel room, like to prove you. And, and I wanted to show you, because it's this thick, right? A big justification about why I think games can be out and why my project should be supported with their money, right? Um, anyway, so I'll just skip over that, because you, yeah, I can't quote for it from it, obviously, um, in a the dramatic way I hoped to. <laughs> Um, so, a couple of my attempts um, to legitimise games were, firstly, I eventually got some funding for this project, it was called Escape from Woomera, and it was about um, the experiences of refugees locked up in um, the infamous detention uh, camps in Australian, the Australian desert. Um, but the idea of making a game about refugees offended many people and organisations, um, large and small. Um, and the idea that we got arts funding to do it offended m even more people. Uh, for an example, um, the Australian Minister for the Arts ordered a governmental inquiry into how this monstrosity got funded. It's, I'm not exaggerating. Um, some people blame me um, for the dismantling of digital media funding um, in Australia some years later. Um, it's all lies. but. Anyway, um, so I, I'd spent two years trying to get this game off the ground and get it backed and supported, and by this time I was really fucked off. So I decided to, to like I had this idea for a, for a festival, right, um, called Free Play, um, to, to prove, like to, to make what we're doing visible, 
Um, and the idea was for a non -cor explicitly non-corporate gamers industry event about making games for cultural art and artistic reasons, not just some sort of corporate event with booth babes. We did actually have booth babes at the Australian Game Developers Conference back in the day. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to challenge perceptions and show the wider community that game developers were serious about making worthwhile culture. But as I've learned uh, over the last um, years, <laughs> if we want to prove ourselves to the gatekeepers of culture, ensuring visibility um, for our cultural practice is not enough. We have to prove to them that the games we make are worthy and that they adhere to some of the rules of high culture. Um, so to do this, um, the idea is to borrow rules from higher prestige, higher culture art forms, like, for example, film, literature, and fine art. And it goes without saying that those art forms are, are Eurocentric and Western-centric. Um, so I'm going to spin off some rules. I'm it's like... I'm often sarcastic, but I'm not 100% sarcastic, so don't, pl please don't take this as entirely sarcastic. I mean, some of this, like, I agree with some of these rules, right? I'm just going to state them, okay? Um, so preferably, your game should be perceived as cre created, um, having been created by a single vision-carrying auteur, or if there's several people, like an artistic collective. Um, and bonus points, if the game expresses the personal experiences and per perspectives of the auteur. Um, now, the auteur debate really um, became current in um, games around 2004 when Jason Rubin, who was the founder of Naughty Dog, made the Un Uncharted games, um, said that what we need in games to legitimise ourselves and to get more creative power for game developers is to develop something the auteur and the, the way that it operates um, in film for example you have a film director they're the auteur um, and then in more recent years um, obviously the, the tools of game development have become more accessible to individual creators and this has become um, more more of a thing P personal games for example is a thing uh, another like another great way to raise the prestige of your game is to add <laughs> an orchestral soundtrack, preferably with a live studio orchestra that you can take photos of and put in your marketing materials. And it, it, worked, for, is Jennifer, it worked for us, so, you know. Uh, we didn't have an orchestra, but we had, like, um, people from the Cambridge Singers, so that's, that's kind of fancy in its own way. Um, another rule, and I don't quite understand this, but I hear it over and over and over again, um, play is good. There are so many airport books, academic books saying this, playfulness, play, paideia. If you say it in Latin, it, it, uh, it, it's better. Um, <laughs> that's good, but rules and objectives, the gamey sort of mechanical stuff, um, for some reason that, that's bad and I've thought about this and I can't work it out. Um, but don't ask me. Ask all the, you know, Intellectuals and artists who say say that. I'll just move on because I don't get it myself. So, number four, um, I don't know why I numbered these in not in any particular order. Is you should privilege gameplay that rewards pro-social behaviours. Um, definitely, probably not violence. Um, pro-social behaviours like cooperation, being nice to people, being a good person, in a moral sense. Um, that definitely helps. And keep the fun as cerebral as possible. And I kind of mean like fun, keep it up here and here. Not so much here and here. Um, that's the best way I can explain. I mean, the simplest way I can explain that, right? Um, that's the thing. I'll just move on because there's people who can explain that better than me. Um, so this kind of... Fun thing. Maybe I'll riff on this a bit. Um, this idea of empty pleasure, right, appealing to physiological desires and impulses and needs, um, sensual, sensuality, excitement, um, visual, visceral excitement, um, leisure and pleasure. Um, too much of it can 
debase and distract you from the worthy elements of the content you have in the game. And I cert this is certainly what I was told in 2003 about our refugee game, right? Um, I mean, this reminds me of um, a debate that was had in London, actually. Um, London being a public, like Charles Burney, heard of Charles Burney, anyone, anyone a philosopher, aesthetician from the 18th century, I think he lived in London. Um, he had this big debate going with these other philosophers about whether music could join the hierarchy of, of the arts, like along with architecture, dance, fine art, um, and, and so forth. And the reason this was controversial was because um, music with words, yep, that's an, a form of art. But music without words, that's kind of fun, right? <laughs> like people get off on music um, in a broad sense. <laughs> and, and the, so without words, you know, what is, it, what is it good for? Like it makes you feel things, but but not in an intellectual way. Um, they resolved this debate, and now today you put an orchestra in your game and that's, that's high culture. Um, but at the time, it was, you know, there was something suspicious about this feeling r rather than this. So anyway, um, oh God. Um, yes, I was gonna segue really elegantly into the next slide. Um, I was gonna say, does this sound familiar? It should, to anyone who has read the criteria for Creative Europe's funding guidelines. <laughs> um, by the way, Astrologasta um, is proudly supported by creative, the Creative <laughs> Europe Media Fund. <laughs> and we are very grateful <laughs> if you're here today. Um, yeah, so, yeah, um, narrative storytelling, video games, or, you know, story, blah, blah, blah. Um, words are very important. Um, still today. Um, so more rules for raising the cultural prestige of games. Um, as we saw from the Creative Europe Media Fund guidelines, you should prioritise story over action if you want to get supported by arts funding in Europe. Um, because we know that film and literature are proper culture, so if we're more like them, then that's good. Um, and that extends to adopting their, their models. Um, narrative, you know, like the three-act structure, the monomyth, um, principles like show, don't tell, R rules for developing well-rounded characters, characters that evolve over time, um, and our games should make people cry. Why do I know this? <laughs> because Steven Spielberg said this in 2004, <laughs> and he's from film, so <laughs> I think the real indicator that games have, be have become a storytelling art form will be when someone confesses that they cried at level 17. <laughs> and this statement was accompanied um, with the announcement that Steven Spielberg would collaborate with EA to bring the magic of film to games. So we all waited with bated breath to see what Steven Spielberg would do, right? Would he make us cry at level 17? And here is the game he made. <laughs> and, <laughs> And look, to be, honest, I mean, to be fair, like, I played this game, it's a pretty good game, right? And it probably made some people cry. <laughs> I won't speculate as to why. But he's obviously very proud of it. Look at him. Look at him, it's like... And there's a sequel called Bash Party, or something. I didn't play that. Um, okay, another one. Um, introduce serious topics and themes into your game, and bonus points if they are painful topics, I know like this worked for me, I made a game about refugees, um, or obscure, um, and imbue your game with importance. And I know this is, this is important because, that's a bit meta, um, I know that um, being important is good, um, and, and it's, because it's a word that's a really key word in the, in the fine art world, right? It's the highest praise, praise you can get in high culture, I think. Um, a month ago, a gallery curator emailed me and said, look, I really want to put your game in this exhibition because um, this game, the game I showed earlier, is an important work. It's an important game. Well, work, he said. So if your game is an important work, it's a good, that's a big tick, clearly. Um, but how important? Like, what does importance even mean, right? Um, and how should we measure it? And this is how we should measure it. 
Um, so I, th I think uh, Jane McGonigal said it best in her TED talk in 2010 when she said, we invest three billion, we invest three billion weekly, hours weekly playing online games. I believe that if we want to survive the next century on this planet, we need to increase that total dramatically. I have calculated the total we need at 21 billion hours of gameplay every week. So there you go. Um, I, like, it's, clear, it's clear that the, the future of humanity depends on the games we make, so you better fucking make your game important. Um, okay, um, we're up to lucky 13, lucky for some. Um, so what, what we've done, like a strategy we've used, and I think it's been working quite effectively, is to create special categories and branding for games, right? To carve out a space um, where we put distance between us and normal games. So I, I, I actually think of this as like a hashtag not all games. Um, there are games and there are art games, for example. Um, you put a, a label on, on the game that says, I am art, put me in your art museum. Um, we also have the category of social impact games. Um, has anyone seen the new Ken Loach film? I haven't seen it yet, but I, I like to think about you know, what Ken Loach would think about this, like a filmmaker like him. Um, he might say, you know, a film that's designed to have a social impact is simply a good film, right? But it seems that when it comes to games, we need a special category. And I think certainly having a special category suits the leadership of um, companies like Ubisoft, who like to claim that normal, regular games are simply entertainment and definitely should not contain any social or political perspective or message. Put that in the social impact games. Um, <clears throat> pause. So, so all this makes me think, like, what if we were to sort of um, start thinking, like, put, put all this aside and, and start thinking about um, low culture? Um, and turn our attention to it and, and look at the way it solves its creative problems. And maybe there's some ideas that we can use um, to create culture that's meaningful. I don't mean, you know, use their gambling, you know, um, techniques and make trash um, games as a service game and, you know. I, I, what I mean is, like, take ideas from low culture, working class culture, <laughs> um, as a, as a way to, to make meaningful and deeper experiences, um, which seems a bit counterintuitive, maybe. Um, I don't think it has to be. The references here I have are pretty Eurocentric. I, I'm, I'm sorry, we are in London. Um, I mean, the Eurocentric apart from the pornography, which I think is fairly universal. Um, so football, grime music, stand-up comedy. I put English Music Hall in there because I'm a big fan of... English Music Hall, because um, it's comedy, right? And it's working class. Um, so now you think, by now you're thinking, this woman worked on Astrologast, which is a wanky like <laughs> a game about like history and big words and stuff. Um, um, and that's true. Um, <laughs> make no apology for that. Um, and it's high culture, um, but it's a game, right? And have you noticed how expensive high culture is to produce? Film and, and, and opera is a really good example, I think. Um, I was thinking about that. It's really expensive. And, and conversely, how cheap low culture is often, often is to produce. And we use some of those cheap-ass methods in Astrologaster to package our high culture in a somewhat low culture uh, package. So one of the things we did was sort of slightly rule breaking in, in, in a way in terms of those high culture or make a great film rules is like, instead of adopting the maxim of show don't tell or play don't show, um, we used a lot of telling. Um, so for example, um, we had unseen characters, and I think unseen characters uh, work really well, particularly in comedy. Um, people may rec 
recognise. This is um, Mrs Slocum from Are You Being Served? And um, she um, had a lot of trouble with her pussy, <laughs> which was a cat, definitely a cat, right? Um, but you, you never see her a cat, so... <laughs> <laughs> Who knows, right? Um, it's funny because you don't see the cat. Um, <laughs> also, like stand-up, I'm no expert on stand-up comedy or even comedy, um, but, you know, like humour is often in the telling um, rather than the actual, actual you know, if, if you showed half of the things that, that stand-up comics said that happened in their lives, I'm sure they'd be quite boring, but they sort of add, you know, like the way they talk about them is somehow funny, right? And I think um, telling is great because it leaves room for amb ambiguity and double entendre and all these kind of... F you leave an imaginative space. And i just, just using that term imaginative space because it sort of, like, adds prestige to this idea of, like, not being able to render graphics and add lots of expensive animations. Um, My pussy oh, got... Oh, shit. I didn't mean to... <laughs> I'll, I'll do it anyway. My pussy got soaking wet. <laughs> So I didn't I mean to, to play. It out in front of the fire before I, I, I said it. to spend an evening in this club. I'll just let it, it go. Be accommodation for my pussy. <laughs> well, now we've got that sorted out. Can we get on? I've got to get home. If my pussy isn't attended to by eight. Any, anyway, you get the get the gist. Um, rep, repetition is another um, thing we we did a lot of and. And when I think back to working on games where it's like you, you're, you're a narrative designer and you're really struggling with, with um, gameplay, you're fighting against the gameplay because, you know, like maybe it's an action game, often is, and it's like fight, 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 fight. There's a cutscene and you need a reason for people to keep fighting. So all cutscenes, something happened. It's like a lame excuse for like something to go wrong involving, you know, violence and the need for more violence. And then you have fight, 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 fight. Another, you know, simplistic narrative excuse, and 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 so on and so forth, right? Um, and you try and work around that. Um, whereas in comedy, repetition is is a great tool, right? Because um, it's a pattern, and patterns are very are great for humour. Um, the rule of three is a pattern, maybe not not relevant to to, to this case, but. Um, Recurring jokes, um, running gags, catchphrases, uh, creating anticipation for the setup, the all important setup of the joke, um, and then oh. not meeting those expectations and then and surprising the audience. Um, another thing we didn't do so much of, but I wanted to mention it because it goes, it's another thing from comedy that goes against the, the this kind of rule about. Um, um, well-rounded characters, you know, going from Mario to sort of um, characters you care about, like in The Last of Us. The, there's a lot of little girls in games that you need to save, and it doesn't really work on me because I don't really care about saving little <laughs> girls. And I'm not, I don't consider myself a father figure either, so that's a real problem. Um, yeah, we, to be honest, we, we tried to be a bit more well-rounded in Astrologaster, but, you know, like, I, what's the problem? I mean, the Commedia dell'arte is now considered high culture and, well, retrospectively, and, and they used stock characters and it worked for them. Um, so I guess I want to sum up by saying um, a few bold statements about comedy. Um, comedy is truth and pain, according to this writer of this book on comedy I read um, called the Comic, the Comic Toolbox. It's very good. Um, John Ingold last Friday told me that comedy was um, intrinsically human, and I thought that was very good, so I added it to the slide. <laughs> um, and uh, Robert McKee, the screenwriter, famously said that comedy is the angry art. And there were a bunch of psychologists um, who, who showed um, experimentally that comedy only really works when there's a, a form of violation, a violation of social norms of some sort of rule. Um, so comedy is, ironically, about breaking rules, right? Um, and I guess my final, my, my observation to try and bring this back to actual comedy rather than complaining about um, funding <laughs> administrators is that, um, yeah, we can say, well, you know, uh, films can make us cry. Maybe we should do more of that. We could, 
You know, I mean, that's, that's what's missing from games. We're not crying enough, we're not feeling deeply enough. Maybe we should notice the lack of comedy in, the, in, in games in our industry at the moment. Because as I said, you know, film and, and, and television and plays and opera have thriving, well-developed, sophisticated, celebrated genres that are based on humour. Um, so, you know, maybe we should, if we're going to test and we're going to put um, games through its paces and, and, um, and, and, and really sort of try, try and achieve great heights of maturity and you know, make games for adult humans, um, maybe it isn't just about making them cry, but acknowledging the importance of making them laugh. Um, and essentially, um, I guess my message is, um, let's take comedy and games more seriously. Thank you very much.